Collusion with Russia was never the crime. This story from our friend, Pastor Chuck Baldwin, former Constitution Party nominee for president, is really one that should have been much more obvious to everyone following all of the related events than it has been, but one that as soon as you see and understand, you go, oh, yeah, and of course, that's why they're covering that up. All of the hoopla over non-existent collusion between Donald Trump and Russia is nothing but political theater. The real crime has been completely covered up by the American media, including the so-called conservative media. In fact, media and political pundits will always cover up virtually any crime committed by this culprit, and they have been doing so since the culprit came into existence. As is so often the case, if one wants to hear or read the truth, one must go to foreign news sources. In this case, that foreign news source happens to be RT.com. That's right, my former employer, Russia Today. I love it. And for people said, ah, Adam, but didn't you used to be a paid Russian propagandist? Russia! Yeah, technically, in the same way that the American founders received help from foreign governments to overthrow the British Empire, I think it's great that today the American people have at least Russia today. There is the uh, finger in the eye of the American government to call them on stuff like this. So here's it's just a couple bits of the RT story. He's totally on board, quote, end quote. Wolf Book describes Trump admin's collusion with Israel. Amid the media hype over Steve Bannon's comments fueling allegations of collusion with Russia, pundits have overlooked an excerpt from the same book that points to collusion between the Trump administration and Israel. In the book titled Fire and Fury Inside the Trump White House, author Michael Wolf describes a conversation between former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon and Roger Ailes, the former CEO of Fox News, who died in May 2017. According to the excerpt published Thursday, Bannon informed Ailes that President Donald Trump, Prime Minister of Israel Benjamin Netanyahu, and their billionaire benefactor Sheldon Adelson are in agreement with moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Whew. Yeah. Now, it's, it's funny that we've known this for a long time, that the Israel lobby that corrupt forces of Zionism have long, uh, since, I mean, really before the inception of the state of Israel, uh, have sought to manipulate the American government to pull support out of it. And now it's to the tune of, I don't know, how many tens of billions of dollars of military aid every year, and turning a blind eye to their nuclear program, and the state of Israel's sordid criminal past, including in the settlements, in Palestine, but also in an incident that we'll get to here in, in just a minute, which really is a smoking gun that I, 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 every American needs to know about American history that you will never, ever be taught in an American government school. So, Adelson is an American casino mogul who donated $25 million to the Trump campaign and funds Israel's most popular daily newspaper, Israel Today, which is widely understood to be pro-Netanyahu. Now, one of the big myths about Donald Trump is that his campaign was self-funded. You know, oh, he's he's a billionaire. He's worth so much money. Why would he ever have to get donations? Why, why would Sheldon Adelson have to give him $25 million? Well, here's the thing. Donald Trump has always been a tool of bankers. Yeah, he's been a manipulator and a con man and a shady business dealer, and he's screwed a lot of people out of money that he's owed them. But what we saw most recently was him giving banks, including Deutsche Bank, that he happens to owe a ton of money, a pass on many of their financial crimes, including those around the LIBOR scandal. So. This is just, I, I hate to say I told you so, but yeah, I told you so. Donald Trump is the greatest trick that Democrats have played on Republicans. I mean, he's a former Democrat. He's a tool of the banks. He's a globalist. I mean, like, and then he goes and masquerades as an American nationalist telling jokes about Rosie O'Donnell. And all of a sudden the Republicans go, oh, Trump, our savior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're going to save us from Clinton and all of her big government, Wall Street, bankster, globalist policies, and give us instead Trump's bankster, globalist, big government policies. Woohoo! 
All right. Um, so this, this story is a few days old. It said Fire and Fury set to its shelves January 9. Though the White House has dismissed the book as fiction, Trump's attorney, Charles J. Harder, demanded the publisher, Henry Holt and Company, immediately cease and desist from any further, further publication, release, or dissemination of the book. Now, here's, there's, there's a, a even just better quote here on this from Trump himself about his former chief strategist, Steve Bannon. Now, remember, Steve Bannon, hugely essential to Trump's victory, hugely essential to everything that the White House tried to accomplish while he was still there. He said, Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency. When he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Yeah. So back to Baldwin. Before discussing the heart of the story, there are a couple of asides that need mentioning. First, Donald Trump obviously doesn't believe that freedom of speech has anything to do with making America great. Yeah, you would, like, like, just, you know, t come on. Come on, Trump supporters. Freedom of speech, please. Does that, does that not shake your confidence in this guy at all? So yeah, he's against freedom of speech. He wants to have a book banned because it says bad things about him. Whew, all right. Furthermore, can you imagine anyone else demanding, uh, demanding a publisher house cease and desist from publishing saying nothing about it? I mean, this is just, I mean, if it was, if it was, the, if the shoe was on the other foot, and of course, you know, liberals are, you know, guilty of plenty of censorship, but essentially, so are conservatives. And the reason is, again, they're both statists, right? They both believe in using violence of government and a central authority to control you. So, of course, yeah, why not use violence to control the flow of information that makes it possible for them to voice the lies upon the American people that make it possible for this whole racket to exist in the first place. So, this comment uh, from Breitbart, some of the comments from, excuse me, from uh, Bannon in the book have led Breitbart.com to fire their leader, uh, Bannon. So all of this is kind of an aside, and, and I, I promise, I promise that with the new Adam versus the man, we won't be covering uh, the, the, the political theater so much. Because it's silly, it's, it's a distraction. Like, I've got to say, like, this is, and I wish there was some, like, uh, uh, maybe clear study that shows some conclusion based on real metrics of this, but it seems to me that the American people are falling for Trump's political theater more than they have for any other president in the past. And it, it's really disgusting because this is, this is the point of the presidency, right? Um, I gotta love Bill Hicks' explanation of the presidency, right? He says, when you get elected, they bring you into a smoky room and the lights go off and a screen drops down and a projector comes on and they show you a shot of the Kennedy assassination from an angle that you've never seen before. And then the, uh, the lights go up and one of the men puffing on cigars says, any questions? And the only question you're allowed to ask is, what's my agenda? So the job of the president is to distract from the, say, uh, the, the fact that the machine carries on, the policies continue, the American people's opinions don't really matter. So here's a bit of what's really going on. And you have to understand, with Russia, and not all uh, Russia collusion, like, who cares? Really, who cares? If the Russian government wanted Trump more than Clinton? Really? Okay. And they're allowed, just like any person in the world, to whatever. I Just you know, to voice their opinions, to hire propagandists. You know, of course, the, the Russian government has no right to exist any more than the United States government, obviously. But both Democrats and Republicans are happy to be using Russia as the scapegoat, to make Russia the international bad guy, so that you don't pay attention to Israel. As Baldwin says, the real story, of course, is the cover-up of Trump's collusion with not Russia, but Israel. 
The chain of command was clear. Donald Trump to Jared Kushner to General Michael Flynn. All of the brouhaha about collusion with Russia that led to the firing of Flynn was merely a smokescreen to cover up the Trump administration's collusion with Israel. And Flynn was the fall guy. Israel's highest ranking foreign agent, Kushner, continues to guide Trump's Zionist foreign policy without the slightest impediment. Because everybody's busy talking about Russia, of course. Israel is America's sacred cow. It is the third rail of politics. No one dares criticize it, much less expose its manifold crimes. Israel is also America's Trojan horse, virtually the entire country, with America's evangelical Christian pastors and churches leading the way is scared silly to say anything critical of Israel. Fortunately, the hackneyed moniker anti-Semitic is fast losing its sting as more and more people are awakening to the rank evil and criminality committed by the Zionist state, not the least of which are a plethora of Jewish people, including rabbis and myself. Now, yes, I'm Jewish. Sorry. And you know what? It's funny that the, the, the conversation around uh, the, the racism, anti-Semitism, and, and the state of Israel and Zionism are so easily, deliberately confused, muddied. And, uh, you know, the idea of being a Jew, uh, and for the record, I'm, uh, I'm half Jewish by ethnicity on my mother's side. Uh, I'm not religiously Jewish. Um, I guess you could say a little bit culturally from my family upbringing. Um, but I'm the opposite of a Zionist, obviously, as a libertarian who believes that states have no rights to begin with. Um, it's really important to separate Jew Judaism, the Jewish ethnicity, the Jewish people from the organized crime family known as the state of Israel and the Zionists. And when you're attacking the state of Israel, as you should, when you're attacking the Zionists, as you should, you don't need to descend to racism to make your point. And it really needs to be separated. And, and, I, and there's some strange effect of this. Now, I asked today on, on social media, ha posting some of the screenshots of the racist comments that I received, why is it more acceptable to be racist towards Jews, seemingly, than other races? You know, if someone uh, went on some, uh, you know what, I don't even want to play the game of this ethnicity versus that ethnicity, but it is understandable that as a certain group of people identifying with Judaism, with ethnic Jews, uh, in, in order to promulgate the racket of the Zionist state, that there's some bleed over effect there. That people of weak conscience and intellect will, in criticizing the Zionism, turn to racism. Um, of course, Baldwin is a better man than anybody who would do such a thing and does not make that mistake. If you don't believe there's an ongoing national cover-up to protect Zionist Israel, consider this case history. A foreign naval vessel is lumbering in international waters. It is flying a brand new eight foot by five foot flag, which unmistakably identifies it as a major ally of the country whose coastline is nearest the ship. The ship's markings are 10 feet high on both sides. It is not a warship. It is an intelligence gathering ship. For all intents and purposes, it is defenseless against any warship or attack, attack aircraft having but four 50 caliber Browning machine guns without shrapnel shields as its only offensive weapons. On board are 286 souls. Suddenly and without provocation, the supposed ally nation attacks the ship with both warplanes, which were unmarked, and torpedo boats. For over an hour, the helpless ship is riddled with machine gun fire, rockets, and torpedoes. Within moments, the ship is completely disabled. As it seems certain that the ship will sink, lifeboats are lowered, but the attacking torpedo boats immediately strafe the lifeboats with gunfire. Helicopters from the aggressive country carrying special forces troops hover over the ship, which is now listing at nine degrees. Clearly, the attacking country intends that no one survive. The ship has no engines, no rudder, and no power. As the special forces from the attacking country are being positioned to launch their final assault, the ship's captain barks, stand by to repel borders. One sailor yells, they've come to finish us off. The only thing that saves that ship and those survivors that day is eight warplanes from a nearby aircraft carrier that heard the initial mayday cry from the ship. This caused the attacking country to withdraw. As it was, 34 of the ship's officers and crew are killed, and only a divine miracle and superhuman Herculean effort 
from the sailors in the bowels of that steel graveyard keeps that ship afloat when the attack first began. One general from the attacking country protested to his commanding officer saying, this is pure murder. But what the country whose ship was attacked and whose men were killed did is most curious. It did nothing. In fact, the government of that country immediately declared that the attack had been a mistake and then proceeded to completely cover up what had happened. And to this day, the citizens of that country know almost nothing about what took place on that fateful day. The attacking country in the above case was Israel. The country attacked was the United States. The date was June 8, 1967, and the name of the ship was the USS Liberty. Now, the mistake excuse, the mistake excuse, really, the mistake excuse. It was a mistake. We just, we accidentally, uh, you know, did this and this and this and this and this and this and led to the killing of all these people. Now, I try to be as understanding as possible when someone in my own life or someone I'm working with says they made a mistake. I always give them the benefit of the doubt. But of course, careful analysis in this case, and in so many others in which this excuse is used, reveals that if it was a mistake, it was an incredibly improbable one. Because you're saying, okay, I, I made a mistake. As Israel, I made a mistake. We didn't really mean to kill all those American sailors. Uh, yeah, it was a mistake. We just, we, we pushed the wrong button on the keyboard and it was, uh, instead of help American sailors, kill American sailors. Was, uh, whoops, and we couldn't stop it. There was no way to abort the mission. We just, no, see, that's the thing. If this was a mistake, it wasn't like it was a mistake. It was like a, a, a series of, I mean, for an attack as complex as this, it was like a thousand mistakes in a row. That if they were mistakes were really, I don't know, one in a hundred mistakes. You push the wrong button. Uh, you bomb the wrong ship. You order the wrong mission. I mean, these already are kind of like, if you're in charge of shit that could kill people, really should be kind of one in a million mistakes, maybe one in a thousand mistakes. But, but then you have... A series of these, so it's a one in a thousand mistake, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. You have to multiply every time. Like, because what are the odds that you made a mistake that was a one in a hundred mistake, or a one in a thousand mistake, and then you didn't catch it? And then you made a subsequent mistake that led to, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. You have to multiply a hundred times, a hundred times, a hundred times, a hundred times, a hundred. And you get to the point where, like, the odds of you making this mistake are so infinitesimally small if, if, if these are your true capabilities that either you need to be completely removed from the job or this was no mistake and we should examine your motivations. So, can one imagine what the U.S. reaction would have been had the USS Liberty been attacked by an Arab nation? Can you imagine how pastors and Christians would have reacted had the attacking country been Iran, Iraq, Syria, etc.? But the attacking country was Israel. Hardly anyone in the United States even knows or cares about it. Now, I am I am really grateful to hear this from a man as uh, esteemed in the American Christian community as Pastor Chuck Baldwin. Because one of the reasons that America has fallen for the Zionist propaganda game is our very own Christian Bible. It says, the Jews are God's chosen people. Okay. You want to believe that? Fine. I guarantee you no reasonable Christian version of God considers Zionism or the state of Israel to be a righteous, holy endeavor. Quite the opposite. And I suppose I might say that it takes a certain amount of courage, but no, it is a simple measure of the integrity of Chuck Baldwin, that he is able to see past his own religious inclinations and still be able to look at reality in a way that's in line with his core principles, informed by his religion or by his humanity, doesn't really matter to me. He concludes, 
And today, the genocidal acts of the Zionist government in Israel against the Palestinian people must be regarded as the single most overlooked ongoing atrocity in the world. Israel commits mass murder with impunity. So once again, a U.S. presidential administration and the U.S. mainstream media have covered up the criminal activity of Zionist Israel. In 1967, the president was Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, and probably the only president whose ego could rival that of Donald Trump. In 2017, the president was Donald Trump, a Republican. When it comes to conspiring with and covering up for Israel, political party doesn't matter. It's business as usual. Zionist business, that is.